I always wanted to be a park ranger. For as long as I can remember. Being out in nature, hiking, camping, and fishing. That's pretty much all I wanted to do as a kid. And once I realized that that profession existed, that was my only career pursuit. And I trained for it like an astronaut going to outer space. Reading up on all the necessary qualifications, I learned that it was a pretty daunting undertaking in a lot of ways. To be a park ranger, you need to be an expert outdoorsman. You need to be physically strong and have good endurance. You need to be confident with firearms if you're working in an area with bears and cougars. And you need to have first aid training and a range of other certifications. But those hurdles didn't stop me, they inspired me. Throughout my late teens and early 20s, I had a cork board on my bedroom wall with every park ranger requirement listed on it, flanked by photos of my favorite national parks. And I checked the qualifications off one by one, celebrating as I achieved them. Living at home with my parents, I saved up every penny I earned with the goal of going to school for conservation enforcement one of a few programs geared towards people in my aspiring line of work. Eventually, I got my diploma from a nearby community college, which was about all I could afford. It took a while, and I worked a lot of shitty, odd jobs. But eventually, I was hired full-time by the Forestry Service as a fire lookout. This was after at least 30 rejected applications, and by that point, the recruiters probably knew my resume off by heart without even reading it. I was thrilled, accepting the job over the phone with a cry of joy, to which my boss laughed and said he was looking forward to meeting me. Throughout my on-the-job training, I picked things up quickly, and my supervisor, named Ross, said I was a natural. It wasn't long before he was sending me out alone to clear brush or do simple tasks, despite the fact that he was supposed to be shadowing me all the time. He said he trusted me, and that it took a lot to gain his trust. On my last day of training at Fire Tower 14, we were sitting in the cabin playing chess when Ross noticed something in the distance, a bit of smoke rising up out of the trees. It was just a wisp of white smoke, indicative of a campfire. Eh, we should probably go check that out. Ross said, handing the binoculars to me and pointing. I saw it immediately and nodded, thinking it would be nice to get out and do something different. The routine of clearing brush and taking out the trash, reading books and playing board games and cards was getting monotonous. It was late afternoon and there were still several hours of sunlight left. I grabbed my backpack and rifle, filled my canteen with water, and was about to set out when Ross muttered something over my shoulder. Son of a bitch, he said a little louder this time. It wasn't like him to curse, and I was a little surprised to hear him do it. Ross had always reminded me of a boy scout in a man's body. His enthusiasm for the job was infectious, and he was always in a good mood. What? I asked, walking over to him. It's another one. Who bothers getting a camping permit anymore these days? He pointed at another fire burning in the distance, this one a little closer. Normally we wouldn't go out to bother campers, but these were not registered camping sites, and people like that often didn't bother to clean up after themselves, and sometimes got injured out in the woods since they weren't prepared. Most people who care enough to go camping properly will actually acquire a camping permit. They know it isn't worth the risk of being fined. These people clearly didn't care. You know what? Ross said, looking at me. This is actually perfect. It's your last day of training, which means... Next time something like this happens, you're gonna be on your own. Nobody around for miles. So, let's split up the two offenders, and we'll each take one. I'll be in radio contact with you the whole time. They look like they're only a couple miles away from each other. How's that sound? Despite the fact that I'd been eager for the job my entire life, now that I was faced with the prospect of doing it alone, I was a little nervous. But I nodded my head, agreeing with his plan. 
All right, let's do it, I said. Just like we practiced, he told me as we began to climb down the stairs from the tower. Don't get into any confrontations. If they want to get into an argument, you walk away. You call me for backup. Otherwise, just leave them the citation, move on. Tell them to find a new campsite or we'll come back to confiscate their gear. You know, the usual routine. The two of us took the jeep, which was parked at the base of the tower, and drove down the dirt trail until we saw the first vehicle, pulled over at the side of the road. It was empty, with no one inside. Okay, you take this one. Radio me once you make contact. Remember, don't take any unnecessary risks. If anything doesn't seem right, just let me know. Ross looked very nervous all of a sudden, and it was making me more worried than I had been a second before. He looked like he wanted to say something else, and opened his mouth as if he were about to do so, but then shook his head as if telling himself not to. After a few seconds of awkwardness, I reassured him I'd radio him once I'd made contact. He told me to get going and stay safe, driving off once I'd shut the passenger door of the jeep. I was left alone, surrounded by wilderness. Taking a deep breath and letting it out, I began to march into the trees towards the smell of campfire smoke in the distance. The brush was thick, since there was no real trail here, but I could see where the campers had dragged their cooler through the shrubbery and could make out their boot prints in the mud. If I had to make a guess, there were at least three or four of them. It didn't take long before I came across a clearing, and standing in the middle of it, was a large stone archway. The human-made structure was about a ten-minute walk from the road and looked like a bridge constructed for a railroad to pass over it. But it made no sense for it to be way out here in the middle of the forest, away from any civilization, and far away from any active railroads. A dirt path emerged from nowhere leading towards this arch and going underneath it to the other side, seeming to beckon me. I didn't know the area well enough to say that this was completely out of the ordinary, but to my eyes it did look unusual. Ross hadn't mentioned any decommissioned railroads passing through this part of the forest, but then again it could have been long out of use and ancient. When I approached the stone archway I got a queasy rising feeling in my stomach, like when you're a kid in the backseat of a car and your parents are driving down a hilly dirt road and you go over a steep hill too fast on the opposite side. Looking through the archway, I saw the sky was a bruised shade of purple on the other side. Black clouds floated along, in stark contrast to the clear blue sky, which I'd seen from the watchtower. I looked over my shoulder, and the sky was blue. I looked straight ahead again, and saw it was that surreal purple shade, but only on this side of the archway. What the hell? I muttered to myself, walking through the stone archway to the other side. The moment that I did, my body broke out in pins and needles, as if every limb had fallen asleep for just a second. But then the sensation passed. I felt as if I had crossed over some threshold into another world. But I convinced myself I was just being foolish, letting my adrenaline get to me. This was simply a new and scary experience, being alone by myself out here, but I would need to get used to it fast. Stealing myself with a deep breath, I squared my shoulders and continued marching forward. The forest was still the same, but the sky was that dark purple shade and I didn't understand why it would look like that. It was still a few hours until sunset, so it wasn't being caused by the sun's approach towards the horizon something else. A forest fire, maybe? Ross, come in, Ross, I said into my radio, which was clipped to my uniform shirt. There was a burst of static, but nothing came after that. Ross, status update, come in, Ross. Again, there was nothing. <laughs> Great, some backup you are. The forest swallowed me up again as I walked along the path until it disappeared. Strangely, the woods were difficult to tra traverse in this section. Huge trees blocked my path, their low branches impossible to get around. I had completely lost the camper's trail, and I was starting to worry I'd lost my bearings altogether. 
so I pulled out my compass to regain my trajectory. When I looked down at the face of the compass, it didn't make sense. It wasn't pointing in any one direction. Instead, it spun around in lazy half and quarter circles, reversing and changing direction constantly. Then it began to spin in a maddening arc, faster and faster, going in circles until the glass broke and the needle flew off into the sky, completely unhinged from the device. I heard it whiz past my ear like a stray bullet. Okay, that was weird. I tried to comprehend what was happening. What could cause a compass to do that? A strong magnet? That was impossible, though. All of this was impossible. I looked up at the sky and traced the bruised purple color, turning my head so I could see behind me. The violet shade now covered the sky entirely, including behind me where it had been bright blue just minutes before. What the hell was going on? I turned around and started back, my heart beating fast, my legs trembling and numb, feeling like blocks of wood attached to at the waist. Had a nuclear bomb detonated somewhere? Was this the end of the world? Was that why the sky looked so strange now? I keyed the radio again, hoping I would get a response from Ross as I blundered through the forest, feeling sick. I felt like I was going to throw up. Ross, come in, Ross. I practically screamed into the radio, but there was no answer. I began to run, picking up my pace. There's that archway, that fucking archway. I should have never gone through it. I could tell it was wrong. I could tell it was evil. That feeling of pins and needles, that rising sensation in my gut. Every part of my body had been trying to tell me not to go through the thing, but I hadn't listened. I'd heard stories before. I'd read tales on the internet of back rooms and hidden interdimensional portals that led to places like this that shouldn't exist. Dimensions locked away through space and time and other mechanisms we don't understand, which people stumble into and can't escape. Stairs that lead to nowhere but take a portion of your lifespan should you decide to climb them, causing you to vanish and disappear from your friends for untold lengths of time. People are missing in national parks all the time. There was no explanation for it. At least not until now pushed aside the brush and made my way to the forest into the clearing where the archway had been. My heart sank as I stared at the blank spot where it had been. The stone archway was gone. I stood there for a while just staring at the blank space where it had previously stood, but it didn't change the fact that the thing had vanished. I spun around in circles thinking maybe I'd lost my way and gone off track. Maybe this was all in my head and I just lost track of time and that's why the sky was purple and why I was having trouble finding my way back. I wasn't trapped in another dimension. I just spaced out and the sun was setting. That was all it was. Nothing more. I convinced myself this was true even though part of me knew that it wasn't. If I kept walking in this direction, I told myself I would hit the dirt road eventually. I was sure enough of my bearings to know that the road lay in this direction and I could be simply walking back to Tower 14 from there once I found it. Sure, Ross would be pissed. He would tell his bosses that I needed more training, but he would say that I wasn't ready yet. But that was okay. Maybe I wasn't. Maybe despite all the years of getting ready for this day, maybe I was. I don't know, maybe I was still just an amateur. With this new plan in mind, I kept walking straight back the way I'd come. I knew better than to push it when I'd already lost my bearings, not to mention my compass. The best bet was just to walk along the back to the safety of the road. The longer I walked, though, the more I began to realize what I suspected deep down was true. The road was not there. Oh no, 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 no. I muttered to myself as my progress came to a halt. It's not here. The road should have been here, even if I was slightly off course, I should have seen it by now, but it was nowhere to be found. Worse than that, the sky was getting dimmer with those horrible black clouds covering up the patches of purple and filling them in with malignant darkness. Ross, please come in. I yelled into the radio for what felt like the hundredth time. 
A clap of thunder boomed overhead, sounding discordant and wrong to my ears. It was a bad imitation of thunder, a foley artist still learning the ropes as he shook at a giant sheet of tin like a rug on cleaning day. It warbled and shook the ground like the reverberations were lasting for far too long afterwards. And that was what did it. That sound of alien thunder brought me over the edge of certainty and I knew for sure in that moment what I'd suspected all along. This wasn't the National Park. This wasn't even Earth anymore. At least not my Earth. I truly had slipped into another dimension through that gateway. Despite how mad it all sounded, I was on the other side of some multi-dimensional portal. And not only that, now the gateway was gone. I was trapped here. Turning around, I decided I needed to go back to the place where I'd found it. Even if it was gone now, I would have to return eventually. That was my only hope. I couldn't stay in this place. I didn't belong here. And who knew what creatures might lurk in the forest like this after dark. Even in our world, there were wolves, cougars, coyotes, and bears. I shuddered to think what version of predator might live unchecked in this universe without people around to keep their numbers down. As if the forest had read my mind, I heard a rustling sound to my right. The light was dimmer now, and it was difficult to see, but I thought I noticed something a ways off in the distance. Ducking behind trees and hiding from view, following me through the dark forest. Was it a person? Kind of looked like one. Hello? I called out, my voice breaking with fear. Hello? I called back, sounding like a tape recording of my own voice, slightly sped up and slowed down halfway through the word. The thing paused momentarily as it ducked out from behind the trees, looking at me, measuring me, standing in plain view for the first time as if letting itself be seen. My skin turned ice cold when I caught a full glimpse of it. It saw me, that was for sure, and it was following me. The dark humanoid shape had grayish blue skin and at least two sets of arms. It walked on two legs and ducked behind each tree as it passed by so as not to be seen. Its face was shrouded in long black hair which covered its visage like heavy curtains. It was completely naked and unclothed, its genitals covered by its long hair, carrying nothing with it. To my eyes it looked like an animal. A creature more than a person, although it walked on two legs and resembled a human. The extra set of arms was the most jarring aspect of it, though it made it feel so much more like a nightmare, like this couldn't possibly be happening. My heart was pounding fast as I tripped over branches and fallen trees, stumbling and rising to my feet and looking to see the thing was even closer now. It was on a diagonal path through the trees, pursuing me, but also making its way closer and closer to me. For the first time, I saw its eyes through the tangled mask of hair. They were reflective and gold like a cat in the night. And then I saw its teeth and its rancid, rotten smile. It rubbed its four hands together in a ball of moving flesh and fingers, like an excited old man about to eat his favorite meal. The creature knew I was scared and it was enjoying itself, enjoying the hunt. Another twig snapped underfoot and I at first thought it was my own foot which had done it since the sound was so close, but then I realized it was only a few feet away, which meant... I spent around in time, just in time, to see a face appear in front of me. At first I thought it was another one of those things, and almost took a wild swing at it. But then I saw the face was human. He was a man wearing a park ranger uniform. His hair was shoulder length and greasy, and he had a long beard which was untrimmed and scraggly. Get behind me! He yelled suddenly, and as I did as he asked, instinctively hearing the sound of movement coming toward us through the brush from where the creature had been. The sound of the rifle's report was deafening. My ears were still ringing when he fired again a few moments later. That's my last bullet, he said, grabbing my arm and pointing at my feet. I hope you brought some ammunition with you. Those things don't like to die. 
Noises could be heard behind us, and I realized that the creature was still in pursuit, despite two well-placed rifle rams. And I was compelled to follow the strange man as he raced ahead of me, looking back at me occasionally to see if I was still trailing him. I didn't have time to ask questions. I didn't have time to think about the fact that this archway was getting further and further away with each step. All I could do was run. And soon the sounds of more racing footsteps joined the first creature. There were several of them. And they were all hungry. Moving in a pack like humanoid wolves. I only hoped this man knew where he was going. And that he had a plan to survive. My first week as a fire lookout stationed at Tower 14 had started off okay. All my life I'd wanted to be a park ranger, and now I was within one day of accomplishing my goal. After this final day of training, I was to be left on my own. But something catastrophic had happened, derailing all of those plans. After seeing two separate fires burning in the distance, my supervisor and I had set off in our jeep to check out what we assumed were campfires. He had left me alone to investigate one group of offenders while he approached the other campsite. And everything was going according to plan until I stumbled across a stone archway in the forest that looked very out of place. On the other side, the sky was purple, whereas on our side it was blue. But I mistook that for the setting sun or some other phenomena and pressed onward going through it. I wish I'd trusted my instincts and stayed on the other side of the arch. Because now I'm trapped in another world with no way home. The archway disappeared, leaving me stranded here, and I quickly realized I wasn't alone. There were creatures in the forest that looked like people, but were not. They had an extra set of arms, for one thing, and they called back to you if you spoke, but they were not human. Despite all odds, I'd been rescued by another park ranger right before getting mauled by the bizarre creatures. This man, who told me his name was David, said he had been trapped in this place for a month. He had a cave which he managed to camouflage with tree branches, allowing us to hide from the creatures after escaping from them. David knew a lot about this place, and he said the creatures avoided a certain part of the forest. So that was where he took me. He had set up traps which only he knew the placement of, and his hideout was there stocked with provisions. A lot of the plant life here is the same as in our world, he told me when we arrived back at his camp. I found a patch of shiitake mushrooms, and I've been surviving off of those more or less. I had a few things in my bag, an energy bar, some trail mix, you know, the usual stuff. But I ran out of that pretty quickly. He showed me his little pile of forged food, and I marveled at how well prepared he was. There were different species of mushrooms, some wild root vegetables, and some roughage he'd set aside to make a salad with. This is incredible, I said, and I thought I was a good survivalist. Eh, you're still young, he told me. I've been doing this sort of thing for a long time. I was in the British Special Air Forces when I was younger. They're highly trained soldiers, sort of like your Special Forces. Since I got across the pond, I've worked here and there, but most recently I've been a fire lookout at Tower 14 for almost 10 years. I let her soft gasp. That's where I'm stationed. You worked at Tower 14? He chuckled. <laughs> worked. Past tense. Damn. Those bastards replaced me already, eh? Well... I guess they must have given up looking for me too then. I thought back to that odd look Ross had given me when he was letting me out of the jeep. He looked like he was going to say something, but maybe don't get killed or disappear like the last guy would have been too on the nose. Maybe he'd been thinking about how this was a bad idea, I realized. Maybe he was thinking we should go together, but instead he'd let me go alone. I felt a twinge of anger thinking about how none of this would have happened if Ross had been shadowing me like he was supposed to. They're still looking for you, I said, not really knowing if that was true. I'm sure they are. They wouldn't just forget about you. 
Ross didn't get around to telling me yet, that's all. I'm still in training. I didn't add that this was my last day of training, or that David's appearance seemed to have been purposely omitted from my orientation. David eyed me suspiciously, but didn't say another word about it. I was going back out to look for more mushrooms when I spotted you. It's too dangerous to go out again tonight, but tomorrow we'll check for the archway again, and I'll show you the shiitake grove. I go to act to that same spot every day and look for the arch. I can't believe I missed it. He was peeling a mushroom with his knife as he spoke. With that last sentence, he hurled the blade across the room, where it clanged against the rock wall, making a loud noise. Quiet! I whispered, yelled at him. I know you're upset, but we're going to get out of here. His face was emotionless as he looked back at me, tears welling up in his eyes. That's what I've been telling myself for the last 36 days, he said. I just hope to God you're right. As I tried to fall asleep that night, I couldn't. The idea of a man like David being brought to tears by this place was almost too much to bear. He was a killing machine, British Special Forces. He would saved my life and pulled me out of a situation where I thought I'd be dead for sure. At least we had more ammunition now. Two guns. Still, that didn't reassure me very much. Those creatures, whatever they were, did not like to die. I managed a few hours of off and on sleep before the sun came up, still appearing that same horrible shade of purple as it had the day before. It was starting to hurt my head. It felt just wrong being in this place, like we didn't belong here. Like the air was too thick and too heavy, not meant for me to breathe. Without even realizing it, I had begun to hyperventilate. I tried to stop myself, to calm myself down, but was unable to. David came over and looked in my eyes, and after a while I started to hear the words he was saying. The cave was still beginning to turn darker and darker all around me, but I could feel myself losing consciousness, and I, I finally managed to listen to him. Breathe deep, he said. Slow it down. That's okay. You're okay. I've lived here this long. The air is breathable. You're okay, big boy. Big deep breaths, lad. Good boy. Okay, that's it. That's better. Keep breathing in and out. After a while, I started to calm down and looked at him gratefully, realizing the predicament I had been in. Thanks, I said. I needed that. Stay there. Get your wits about you. I've got breakfast ready, he said, and I realized he had a portion of mushrooms and wild lettuce set aside for me. He brought it over on a flat rock and handed the food to me. What's the plan? I asked, eyeing the food suspiciously. Despite the fact that he said it was okay, I was still concerned. Eat, he told me. You need your energy. We're going to walk back over to the shiitake patch. On the way, we'll check for the arch. On the way back, we'll check again. That's all we can really do. It's not safe lingering out there for too long. Those things, they can smell us. I managed to eat a bit of the salad and mushrooms, despite the fact that they made me uneasy. Consuming anything, even the air in this world, felt wrong. Like I was breathing in toxic fumes, not meant for hum human consumption. Still, a little bit of the food wouldn't hurt me. At least, that's what I told myself. After eating, we set out for the archway. The hike was a long one, and David brought plenty of water and provisions, filling up our canteen from a spring along the way. Once again, I felt glad for his guidance. If not for him, I'd probably be dead ten times by now. After a long while, we reached the clearing where the arch had been. Once again, it wasn't there. The spot where it had been was empty, but he wandered over to it anyways. How can it just disappear, be here one day and gone the next? I asked. David shook his head. How could any of this be possible? I wouldn't have believed it if someone told me, would you? I thought about that for a few seconds. No, probably not. I think they were crazy. Or high. 
or maybe both. And yet, here we are, defying all rational common sense. There wasn't much more to say, so we continued walking. I tried desperately to ignore the feeling that I heard the sounds of rustling leaves behind us, as if someone were following quietly and at a distance. Every time I looked back, there was no one there. Eventually, we reached the shiitake patch. David told me to start picking mushrooms quickly before the creatures found us. He said they were smart, and would send out scouts. So once they knew where we were, more would be gathered, and they would come back to hunt us like pack animals. The worst part was they knew this was a favorite spot of his, so they would be ready for him. After a few short minutes of gathering mushrooms, David told me to wrap up. Let's go, he said. There's no more time. Despite my fear, I couldn't believe what he was saying. We had just started. It had been such a long hike, and a small amount of mushrooms would barely sustain us for a day. Come on, David, a few more minutes. I said, let's go! He hissed at me, his face morphing into one of rage. I almost didn't recognize him. His color changed, going red, almost purple. And there was something else strange, too. His chest seemed to spasm when he was angry. The fabric puffed in and out in a very strange way, like he was breathing much too fast. He caught me looking at him and calmed down slightly, then came over to me and grabbed my arm, dragging me away from the mushroom patch. I can see one. It's a little ways away. Six o'clock. That means there's more. We need to start walking fast. Don't run. Don't, don't look. Don't let them know we saw them. All of this he said while dragging me away from the mushroom patch, and I fought the urge to glance over my shoulder. But I did hear the distinct sound of movement now coming closer, gaining on us steadily. Do you hear that? I asked, my heart pounding faster, my throat dry, my knees shaking. Quiet, he whispered angrily. I was silent for a few short seconds, and the noises came closer and closer. Run! He screamed, and I began to bolt as fast as I could through the trees. A second later, I heard them all around us. They had us surrounded. They'd been waiting for us. Your gun! David screamed from behind me, and I tried to get ready while still running. Then I saw what he was worried about. One of the creatures was straight ahead, waiting for us, partially hidden behind a tree. It revealed itself, just barely poking its head out to look and see how far off we were, then it disappeared again. You see it? He shouted. Yeah! We'll get to that tree. You go left. I'll go right. Don't get too close. I understood immediately what he was doing. He was sacrificing himself for me. By going to the right, he was running right through the eye line of the creature. He would be running right past it within inches of its grasp, all to distract it so it wouldn't get me. Part of me wanted to argue, but there was no time. We were already at the tree. I broke to the left, and David went right. The creature lunged at him just as I'd feared and managed to rake him with its long talon-like fingernails. His back was bloodied as he ran, getting ahead of me as he put on speed. There's more up ahead, he yelled, and I saw them a second later. There were at least two, maybe more, hiding in the trees and waiting for us a little ways ahead. I had a feeling they would not be fooled as easily as the last one. Luckily, we had a speed advantage on the creatures, at least the ones we'd come across so far. I hated to think what a faster version of these things would look like. Our ability to outrun them was the only thing keeping us alive. I could hear them chasing after us, their heavy footsteps loud as they crushed the leaves underfoot. Let's split up, David said. You go left, I'll go right. When we meet in the middle, it's a hundred paces from here, got it? Sure, I agreed, not sure what other options we had. I was deferring to him, since he seemed to know what he was doing. Now! He yelled, branching off from our trajectory, heading to the right. At the same time, I went left. The creatures took a moment to respond, but once they saw what we were doing, they left their hiding spot where they were waiting to ambush us. The creature closest to me 
came at me from my right, and I screamed as it came within a few feet of me, its horrifying arms reaching out to grab me. I felt the breeze from its hand rushing past, but managed to duck out of the way just in time, stumbling over a fallen log and face planting right afterwards. The thing crawled after me, and I felt it grab my ankle, pulling me towards it as it screamed. Kicking as hard as I could with my other leg, I brought my foot up into the creature's jaw, where it connected with a sickening crunch. It howled a hurt cry of anger as its grip loosened on my ankle for a split second. I attempted to wrench myself free, but it held on tightly. The thing was so strong. I was about to kick it again when it grabbed my other leg and began to crawl in towards my face. Its oversized eyes widened with anticipation, drool pouring out over its lower lip. The thing was about to eat me. As it unhinged its jaw like a python about to consume a deer, I remembered my rifle slung across my back. The thing darted its head forward towards my neck, as if to start its meal with my jugular. The rifle was caught underneath my body weight. I was trying to rock side to side to pull it free while simultaneously shoving the thing away from me with my knees, kicking and bucking and doing anything I could to weasel my way out of its grasp. Just as its teeth were about to shut around my windpipe, I managed to free the rifle. Using all of my strength, I pulled my knees back and kicked the creature in its chest, sending it reeling backwards for half an instant. Just enough time for me to get a shot off. The blast echoed through the forest, exploding outwards from the barrel of my rifle. One moment the creature was there in front of me. The next, its head was gone, replaced by a bloody crater jettisoning blood from the ruined remains of the creature's visage. I scrambled to my feet and ran, not looking back. After a long, harrowing run through the forest, I met up with David again. He looked even worse for wear than before. Whereas I had gotten away cleanly, he had been mauled by one of the creatures, just barely escaping with his life. He was bloodied and had gashes on his neck, his forehead, and both of his arms from defensive wounds. And worst of all, he lost his gun in the process. And now we were down to only one weapon for defense, and half of the ammo. Eventually we arrived back at the cave, after a long run through the forest, barely escaping with our lives. David was in rough shape, and I helped him lay down on his bedroll. I went outside to find leaves or whatever possible to patch up his wounds in the absence of bandages. I had a small first aid kit with me as well, which I brought everywhere but it wasn't nearly enough for the injuries he'd sustained. I cleaned his wounds and packed the worst of them with gauze from my first aid kit, then wrapped them up with long leaves from the forest. David began pushing me away when I went to unbutton his shirt to tend to the wounds on his back. I told him to calm down, but he wouldn't stop resisting me. Eventually, I relented and told him to deal with the cuts himself. They wouldn't heal properly if he didn't do something about them but he just closed his eyes and drifted off to sleep, the blood running from his wounds, leaking out onto the rock floor of the cavern while he snored. For the second night in a row, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about David and his injuries. He would be dead by morning if I didn't do something. There's too much blood loss. I couldn't understand why someone with his level of experience wasn't taking this seriously. Was he delirious? Suddenly his snoring stopped. The cave was dead quiet and still in the darkness of the night. And then I heard a sound like rocks being moved, a shuffling of feet. Bones creaking and cracking. There was a wet, sloppy sound. Smacking lips and rending flesh. Someone pulling meat from bone and tearing gristle with sharp incisors. I peered into the darkness of the cave, looking in the direction of the sound, and my eyes slowly began to adjust. David was up. He was eating something in the corner of the dark cave. It looked like... Was it moving? A... Was that a rat? 
or squirrel? He took another bite of flesh from the writhing thing which had been moving in his grasp, and suddenly it was still again, and the only sound was of him chewing. My eyes adjusted further, my heart pounding rapidly. David's shirt was off. He had treated his wounds after all. In the darkness, when I'd been trying to sleep, my eyes closed, he'd been busy dealing with his injuries. And I realize now why he hadn't wanted me to see beneath his clothes. It all made sense suddenly. The twitching beneath his shirt when he got upset. The way his color changed when he was angry. His face had turned red, almost purple, like the sky. Beneath his shirt was the most obvious change of all. He took another large bite of whatever it was he'd found scurrying in the cave, and with his four quickly moving hands he pulled flesh from the bones, and crammed more of the creature into his mouth. His eyes were golden and reflective when they caught me staring at him in the darkness. And as I got to my feet, I began to run. I stumbled out from the cave, terrified. My legs didn't seem to work properly. Everything around me was wrong. The colors, the shadows, the shapes of the trees, and the sounds of the singing birds sitting in their branches. This world was not my own, and I needed to get out. Now. Running as fast as I could through the forest, I remembered how I had come to be in this place. As a park ranger trainee, I'd been on fire lookout assignment, and had been sent to confront a few campers who had made a bonfire without a permit in an off-limits area. But I had stumbled through a gateway to another world in the process, becoming lost in this strange place. Trapped in another dimension, where humanoid creatures with gray skin and four arms hunted people in the purple-tinged darkness. I fell flat on my face, landing hard after tripping over something. A vine? No, whatever it was, it was thin and sharp, and it hurt me badly. The piano wire, or whatever it was, had cut across my shins, and I felt the warmth of blood trickling down from the skin. The traps. I'd forgotten all about the traps David had set all throughout this part of the forest to keep him safe from the creatures in this terrifying world. I'm back! I heard David yelling over my shoulder from the darkness. It's not safe, you must come back! But I didn't listen. I scrambled back to my feet and began to run. My only thought was to get to the archway. The place where I'd entered this world, the portal back to Earth, had to be there, it had to be. David's voice could be heard receding into the darkness behind me. I shuddered involuntarily, thinking about how I had seen him in the darkness of the cave, eating something like a rat or a mouse. Not only that, but his arms. His arms had been too many. There were an extra pair of hands working at the hairy flesh of the vermin he'd been eating. The bloody fur and the tearing sounds of him ripping chunks from the creature's body with his teeth were too much to think about. At first I thought maybe he was lying to me from the beginning and that he was from this place all along. Maybe he was born here and was trying to keep me trapped in this place. But the more I considered it, the more I realized that that idea didn't sit right with me. David was not a denizen of this terrible, violet-tinted world, no. He was from Earth. The way he spoke, talking about Fire Tower 14, which he said he had worked at, proved to me that he was not from here. He was from Earth. My mind began to work out what this meant and came to the conclusion that being in this world changed you over time. Being here, eating the forged food and breathing the purple-tinged air, all of it was toxic to people from our world. And it caused side effects that were likely permanent. I only hoped I hadn't been here long enough for a change to occur in me. 
I shuddered at the thought of an extra pair of arms splitting open the flesh of my abdomen and reaching out, grabbing anything they could get their hands on. Hungry. Desperate for food, for blood and flesh and... Fuck. I need to get out of this place. Running through the woods more carefully now, I lifted my feet high off the ground to avoid tripwires and hoped that I didn't stumble into a spike-filled pit or some other death trap which David had planted. Before being hired as a fire lookout, David had served in the British military, in the SAS, a highly trained branch similar to the Special Forces in America. He was a deadly shot with a rifle, and I no longer had mine with me. I picked up my pace, hearing the sound of him coming after me through the forest. He was injured, and that would slow him down, but he also knew this place far better than I did. He knew where the traps were located and how to avoid them, whereas I was just hoping to be able to find my way back to the archway. The possibility of getting lost forever in the wilderness of this strange world occurred to me briefly, but I tried my best not to think about it. Trying to remember the way we traveled through the forest, I stepped tentatively across the ground, no longer running but slowly walking through the trees now. I was terrified of stepping on a spike or tumbling into a pit with spikes at the bottom ready to impale me. David had told me once to never go outside alone, since he had placed traps everywhere in this area. There was a noise close behind me and I looked back to see David was following me from a distance, gaining on me, and I picked up my pace and began to run again. Come back, he called after me, his voice sounding different now, distorted and wrong. It's not safe. Breaking into a sprint, I hoped to lose him in the darkness. And for a time, it seemed to work. He was slower due to his injuries or his mutations and was hobbling when I saw him again, trailing me from a distance now. Confident that I'd managed to escape the section of forest where he was hiding his traps, I began to make my way towards the archway. There were certain landmarks David had shown me to find my way back to it, but none of them looked quite the same at night. In fact, nothing looked the same at night. I was starting to worry that I'd become completely lost when I finally saw the huge oak tree with its one low branch that pointed the way. Following David's prior advice, I continued traveling in that direction. After a long period of walking, I realized the sun had begun to rise, looking purple and bloated and wrong as it always did in this world. But at least it gave another indication of which direction I should be working towards. And it helped to light the way, making the landmarks more obvious as I came across each one. Here was the babbling brook I would follow for a little while, and there was the strange boulder that looked like a face. I felt a pang of regret at leaving David behind after he'd saved my life, showing me how to survive in this world. But then I shook my head and reconsidered. No. I could not go back to that cave. Maybe he was eating rats now, but what if tomorrow he developed a taste for my flesh? What if I woke up to find him hunched over me, eating my leg or my foot? No. Going back was not an option. If David was still following me, there was no indication of it. I couldn't hear him chasing me anymore, and he wasn't calling after me. Maybe because he was worried about alerting the creatures to his presence. The clearing where the archway had been was not far now. It was just another ten minutes or so of walking, and I was just hoping it would be there this time. If it wasn't, I was completely unsure of what I would do. I'd been trying not to think about that part of things, since the idea of the portal not being there was too much to bear. Come back! Someone called out from the woods suddenly, startling me. It was David again. At least it sounded like him. Is it safe? Another voice called out from my right, sounding sped up, then slowed down, like a tape recorder running low on batteries. Leaves crunched on the ground behind me and ahead of me, And from all angles, there were now voices calling out in distorted tones. Come back. It isn't safe. 
Crumbrack! Is it safe? The more they said it, the more the words didn't sound like words anymore, but just strange alien noises. They mingled together in a echoing cacophony of sounds. My heart began to pound against my sternum like a jackhammer from the inside. My palms were sweating as I tried to lift my legs to run, but realized they wouldn't move. It was at that moment that I observed the fact that I didn't have my rifle. And it dawned on me for the first time that I had left it back at the cave. With David. And as that thought went through my mind, the trees and shrubs all, be- all around me began to rustle and sway, moving aside to reveal the gray, four-armed figures who had been lying in wait. If you know a particular spot, they'll start to wait for you there. They're adept hunters, and they know exactly how to ambush someone. Trust me, I've seen it for myself. David had told me. Yeah, I thought bitterly. He'd seen it firsthand with the rat in the cave. As he was turning into one of them, he was becoming a pretty good hunter himself. The pack of creatures closed in on me from all angles, and I sucked in a terrified breath, unable to scream or run or do anything at all. It was hopeless. Or so I thought. The blast of the rifle was deafening in the stillness of the forest, and I winced at the sound of it as it took the head off the creature closest to me, which was just about to grab hold of me. Run! David screamed from the trees, and this time I could tell very clearly that it was his voice. But at the same time, he looked different. He left his shirt back at the cave, and an extra pair of arms on his abdomen were plainly visible now, and I could see they were holding the rifle. With four hands moving rapidly, David reloaded the gun in a fraction of the time, then had the sights up to his eye again and was ready to fire. I did as he asked, trying to pry my eyes away from the horrifying image of what was happening. The creatures were abandoning me to go after a bigger threat, and I saw them stomping through the brush towards him as he fired the gun again, taking off the top of one of their skulls in a bloody spray. A chunk of gray matter landed on my cheek, and I brushed it off in disgust. Getting to my feet, I began to run, but one of the creatures stopped me. The one David had just shot was still alive somehow, and grabbing onto my leg, digging its talon-like claws into the flesh of my ankle, gritting its teeth and staring up at me with a brainless, evil hunger. I screamed and howled in pain, turning away and using my other foot to stomp on the thing's face. As it spit out broken teeth, it smiled at me, squeezing and digging its nails in deeper until I could feel blood pouring out and soaking through the fabric of my sock. Come back! It croaked in David's voice. Finally, I stepped on the thing's arm, wrenching my leg free from its grip. It was like the thing felt no pain at all as it was immediately trying to come after me again with its other good hands. It was like all it desired was to cause pain, but felt none of its own. Trying not to think about that, I turned away and began to run, limping on my one injured leg, ignoring the pain as I broke into a sprint. And just as I got out of sight from David, I heard him cry out in anguish. His screams cut short as one of the creatures began to chew on his windpipe and all that could be heard after that was a hushed, gurgling sound far back in the distance, as he drowned on his own blood. Somehow I knew, without even seeing it happen, that David was dead. But I had no time to mourn for him. I rushed through the trees, trying to ignore the pain in my leg, hoping with every fiber of my being that the archway would still be there. I spoke the words in my mind out loud over and over again, like a mantra, as the clearing came closer and drew into focus. Please be there, please be there, please be there. And when I came out from the trees into the clearing, I almost couldn't believe my eyes. Was this a dream? A mirage? A fantasy that would disappear when I blinked my eyes and opened them again? 
No. It was there. It was actually there. The archway was back. And just in the nick of time. Without a moment's hesitation, I ran through it, terrified that it would disappear before I got the chance to step through the threshold and back into my dimension. Like a man terrified of elevators and worried the box will drop out at any second, I leapt through the archway and back into the glorious golden sunlight of our world. I realized immediately what I had been missing as the blue sky above could be seen through the trees, and I noticed I was truly warm for the first time in days, as if I had been walking in shadow and only now was stepping out into the sun. As I began to walk back towards the road, I took a nervous look back over my shoulder at the archway, and I froze when I saw the disturbing sight behind me was still there. I could still see the purple sky on the other side, and that could only mean one thing. The portal was still open. Terrified of what that implied, I shuddered and continued walking, looking back every so often for creatures and hoping that the archway would disappear, this time for good. But it didn't. As I left it behind in the trees and lost sight of it, my last glimpse showed the evil purple sky shining through from the other side, insidiously waiting for another hiker to stumble through. Or worse, for something else to emerge from the other side. At least if I have to face another one of those creatures, it will be on my turf. I thought to myself with some slight reassurance. But I didn't have a weapon, and I would need backup. I wasn't out of the woods yet. After limping through the forest for 10 or 15 minutes, eventually I found the road. A part of me had been worried it wouldn't be there, that this would just be another world that looked like ours one of a million different potential places that the archway could take you to, and that I would find myself wandering through some unknown forest yet again, set upon by some new breed of ravenous creatures with a thirst for blood. But thankfully this did look like my road, and it had been the one I had been on before. I could even see the distinctive tread marks in the mud from what appeared to be the jeep maybe from the day when Ross had dropped me off in this very spot. I felt a twinge of anger at the thought of my supervisor, and decided I would let him have it the moment I saw him. He was supposed to be my backup. I was supposed to be learning from Ross. And instead, he'd let me go out on my own. And now look at what had happened. Limping along the shoulder of the gravel road, eventually I saw the fire tower come into view up ahead, it came into focus gradually, emerging from the trees that hid it from my sight. The jeep was there, and I realized instantly what that meant. It meant that Ross was up there. He wasn't out looking for me like he should have been. But then if he'd been where he was supposed to be, none of this would have ever happened. I climbed the wooden steps leading up to the fire tower, getting more and more enraged as I got further up closer to the man who I now believed was responsible for all this. My aching leg was bloodied and I could feel it swelling and my pant leg tightening around it. Finally I reached the top and threw open the door to find Ross sitting at the table, reading a book, drinking a cup of coffee and looking quite comfortable. He looked surprised to see me and shocked at the sight of me. Holy shit! He screamed, almost knocking his coffee cup over. The brown liquid spilled all over the pages of his paperback. You're back! That's right, motherfucker. I hissed, limping towards him. I could feel my face turning hot and red. His eyes widened further. Uh, what's wrong with your face? Are you okay? You're turning... Uh, purple. I didn't know what to say to that. I looked in the mirror to my left and saw that he was right. I didn't look like myself at all. I looked like a monster, made of rage at that moment, my face purple with anger. Suddenly all of the fight left me and I realized how utterly exhausted I was. I heaved out a great sigh and crumpled to the floor of the fire tower cabin. I collapsed, unable to understand what was happening to me. I didn't feel like myself at all. 
And as I was sitting there on the floor, I felt something writhing inside of me. A squirming feeling in my abdomen, like fingers reaching out from inside, trying to poke and tear their way through the skin of my belly. I screamed, pulling out my shirt and clutching my abdomen, feeling the skin for a bulging pair of hands or a face, picturing that scene from the movie Alien. But there was nothing there. No indication of anything growing or mutating inside of me, except a slight tingling there, like fingers gently brushing up against my skin from the inside, tickling me very lightly. No, I said aloud, still clutching myself tightly. Dude, where the fuck happened to you? Ross asked, looking at me with grave concern. You're gone for two days. Yeah, you come back screaming, grabbing at yourself? Your face just went purple as an eggplant. Like you had anaphylactic shock for a few seconds, and now it's back to normal again. Tell me, please, because I am genuinely very fucking concerned. What the hell happened to you out there? It took a few seconds before answering. I didn't honestly know what to say until the words began spilling out of me. Same thing that happened to David. That's what happened to me. There was a delayed reaction as it took several long seconds for him to register the name, but then he did, and his jaw dropped. How? Where did you hear that name? How do you know about David? I met him, I said, and was about to continue when I heard a sound from beneath the fire tower. It sounded like someone coming up the stairs. I shot to my feet, my eyes darting around the room. Where's the rifle? You need your rifle, now! Ross didn't know what to make of this at first, and was about to question me, but then the look on my face seemed to convince him. He ran over to the gun rack on the wall and pulled down his rifle. Checking to make sure it was loaded, he took the safety off. Is that David? He asked. I shook my head, no. What the hell did you get us into, exactly? He asked nervously. But before I could respond, there was someone at the door. There was a sound of scratching. Long nails against the wood, scraping it. And there was a distorted gray face at the window, looking in at us. I'm back! It demanded. Ross held the scope up to his eye and got ready to fire at the door. And then the footsteps began to recede, going back down the stairs. The fuck was that thing? Ross asked, lowering his gun. I tried to gather my thoughts, tried to figure out how to explain it all. <sighs> Those things... Whatever they are, they're deadly, I said. And they're not from this world. They're smart. They're almost impossible to kill. Right now they're getting reinforcements. It looks like they're retreating, but they're assembling a hunting party. How can you possibly know all this? I led him outside and pointed down at them below. They were going back for more of their own kind to bring them into our world. As I looked down from the lofty fire tower, I could see them moving quickly into the forest. Some were going back to the ar archway, but not all of them. They were planning on staying here, making this their new home. After all, there was an abundant food supply, and no reason to leave. I tried to sum up what had happened as well as I could in such a short time. It was difficult for him to believe, but the proof had been right in front of us. The monster had been right outside the fire tower, and we'd seen more of them below us. There was no way to fake that. We needed to do something, fast. Okay, assuming you and I haven't lost our minds and just hallucinated whatever that thing was, I'll take your word for all this. So what the hell are we going to do? My supervisor asked reluctantly. I considered this for a few long moments. How much gas do we have between the generator and the jeep? I asked. 
His eyes went wide after he realized why I was asking. For a while, he didn't answer, but then he nodded his head and waved for me to follow him. Enough, he said as I followed him down the stairs. There's enough. You might have heard about the wildfire on the news. It was a big one. There was speculation it was caused by hikers or careless campers. But the real reason why the blaze started was never truly discovered. No one would have guessed it was set by two rogue park rangers. And fire lookouts, no less. The forest fire spread and took out a lot of homes. But everyone who lived in the area made it out alive. Thankfully, no one died. I don't know how I would have lived with myself if they had. I was fired from the park ranger service after that happened. As was Ross. With all the news coverage and social media outrage, someone had to be blamed for what had happened. And we were the most viable scapegoats. Especially since we were the fire watch lookouts. And we'd been seen fleeing the area long before the blaze was ever reported. Our excuse was that the fire started near the road, and we had been down by the jeep when we noticed it. Believing our lives were in danger, we'd fled from the area before our escape route could be cut off, and told our supervisors that we hadn't been able to radio in the report until afterwards. Unfortunately, there's no way of really knowing if we killed those things, or if we destroyed the archway. Maybe it can't even be destroyed. Maybe those things can't be killed. It's been years since all this happened. I'm terrified of the forest these days. I stay out of the woods, away from nature entirely. I live in a big city far away from all that business. I work in a high rise and live in an apartment building. And when people ask if I want to go camping, I say hell no. People tell me I'm strange. They talk about me behind my back. That's okay. One thing that people find peculiar about me is that I never go swimming. I never take my shirt off. And I don't date or try to find a girlfriend despite people trying to set me up. I don't want anyone to see the changes that have been happening. The arms that have fully sprouted from my abdomen and have a mind of their own. I try to tie them down to strap them down with duct tape so they can't move, but they always manage to free themselves. They're very crafty in that way. And they brought with them an unusual appetite. I've found myself craving the most disturbing things. Things that crawl and skitter in the subways and in the sewers. Things I have to chase and kill and rip flesh from bones with my bare teeth. It scares me to think about what I'm becoming, and part of me will always be terrified. A voice in my mind screaming that this is wrong. I need to get help. But another part of me is getting used to it. A primordial alien part of me is starting to very much enjoy the hunt.